You're watching the Honolulu Mayoral Debate, presented by KITV4 News and CivilBeat.com. Welcome back, and now our final round as the candidates ask questions of each other. We're going to begin this round with Mr. Cayetano, a question for one of your opponents. This is a question for Kirk. Kirk, uh, in the forums that we've had, I've asked you continually to, to explain why you, you don't have a backup plan in the event that uh, the $1.5 billion is not uh, forthcoming or in the event that there's a cost overrun not covered by the, the, the current uh, uh, appropriations. Uh, what will you do? You know, Ben, I've, asked, I've answered the question many times. Uh, I don't think you want to accept my answer. Um, and I could throw the same thing back at you on your bus rapid transit, sure. which you say is uh, you, th you believe you get federal money. But let's talk about the facts. The facts are that no rail project anywhere in the country has gotten as far as this one with the FTA support where the full funding does not come. No rail project anywhere in the country. We are down to the very, very end game. The request for the full funding grant agreement has gone in. We're going to be hearing back shortly, and the commitment for the $1.55 billion will have been made. We've already received hundreds of millions from the federal government. We have a president. We have a senior senator. We have an entire congressional delegation. We have the secretary of transportation and the head of the FTA all on board. This project is much just like it's our project. It's also FTA's project. It's the federal government's project. They're committed. We're going forward. It's going to get built. Mr. Carlisle, you can have a question for one of your appointments. You know, I am going to ask a question of uh, Brother Ben, and that's this. Uh, when you were asked about contractors suing the city if rail was uh, stopped, uh, you told the advertiser, I think it was, why would a local contractor sue the city and then expect future work, which is, seems to suggest that selected contractors will not s uh, receive work. Uh, and. I think you, are you aware that that would be a violation of the procurement laws? I certainly didn't mean it that way, Peter. Okay. You know, but but, but let, me, let me ask you this question. Is this your question to me? No, <laughs> this is part of my answer to you, okay? I'm not allowed to respond to no, it, though. you're not allowed, yeah, you're not allowed to respond <laughs> to it. I think, the question, I think the question here should be, how did the contracts be yeah, let out this early when the FTA advise the city not to issue these contracts prematurely. As a result, the people of this city and this island uh, will find themselves in a bind if the money doesn't come through. Now, uh, you know, uh, Kirk forget to, forgot to mention that uh, uh, besides the president, uh, Senator Inouye, and all the folks that he's, he's talking about lined up behind the rail system, uh, there's another house. It's called the House of Representatives, and that's controlled by the Republicans. And the question is, uh, will they agree to uh, give little place like Hawaii, I mean, uh, Oahu, uh, $1.5 billion? I doubt it very much. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Caldwell, you have a question for one of your opponents? I have a question for Ben. Ben, you have said in interviews that you have never been interested in city issues in the past. And when asked, quote, if there was not a rail project, what, you do, what would you be doing in your day-to-day -day life, end quote? And you said, quote, probably writing a book, end quote. How can you say that you are not a one-issue candidate? Because, Kurt, I'm in this race because I see rail as the 800-pound gorilla in the room that you don't seem to notice, and I know from my experience as a governor, as a former governor, that is going to affect the rest of the programs that the city has a responsibility to deliver to the people. Now, it's already affecting those programs. It's affecting uh, 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 the uh, CIP appropriations for uh, uh, fire equipment, for police equi equipment, for example. Uh, it's affecting the amount of money that's been uh, uh, requested or appropriated for road repaving. All those kinds of funding are supposed to go up if you want to solve the problems. And that's why I'm in the race. You, know, you guys don't seem to know anything except rail. That's all you talk about. The only time you talk about sewers and the, the, the water system is when I bring it up. 
All right, thank you, Mr. Caetano. And now, Mr. Caetano, your chance to ask a question of one of your opponents. Okay, I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask Peter a question. <laughs> Peter, same question that I asked uh, Kurt. If the funding doesn't come true, if there's a cost overrun, uh, uh, you said that you would plow ahead, which means that you will raise taxes in order to fund the system. No, it does not. It means that what we would do is we would continue with our mandate. The city charter requires us to build steel, rail on steel wheel on steel rail. And we would continue that, but it would be necessarily a, a either a more value engineered program with fewer transit stops, which you can add later on, or it could also mean that we wouldn't take it all the way to the conclusion until we got those things. But I, I have to tell you that it's a hypothetical I don't buy because no project has ever gotten this far where you actually have it under construction and you have a full funding agreement that was sent over uh, for now the next sort of formal procedures and processes has ever been stopped. And so if we have support both from the uh, House and the Senate on this, granted at different uh, amounts, uh, that tells me that we're going to be getting something that will allow us to go forward. So I'm very satisfied that the situation is that we are going to get those funds and we're as close to getting a guarantee, as, in my opinion, uh, as is possible under the law. And to my mind, I agree with Senator Inouye, the only thing that's going to stop it now is World War III. And I hope for all three of us that doesn't happen. All right, Mr. Carlisle, thank you. And now you get to ask a question of one of your opponents here. You know, Mr. Caldwell, my campaign in 2010, uh, when I was elected mayor, we raised $600,000, and we ended up with a 78, excuse me, six six hundred thousand dollars we ended up with a seventy eight thousand dollars left over after the end of the campaign that same campaign you spent almost one point two million dollars and carried a personal debt of one hundred and eighty eight thousand dollars from twenty ten is that the kind of spending we can expect from you if you're elected mayor uh... peter as andrew asked in one of his questions he says i i've spent most of my life in the private sector which is correct almost thirty years uh, i'm not a professional politician i came to politics later in life when I was 50 because I wanted to do public service. I wanted to make a difference in people's lives every day. And I've loved serving the public. But I don't have the name recognition that you have. I wasn't the prosecutor uh, for 14 years running in island-wide elections. And today, I w I'm not the former sitting governor. Two terms and two terms as a lieutenant governor. My name recognition is a lot lower. I represented a beautiful, small, little, narrow sliver of Oahu called Manoa Valley, and I loved it. So I needed to raise this money and spend this money so that people got to know who I am. And guess what, Peter? I almost won. <laughs> On election day, I was about two percentage points behind, a total of four. And I think, you know, for someone who is so far behind, and most people didn't know, it worked pretty darn well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Caldwell. And you have a question now for one of your opponents. Uh, this question goes to Ben. Ben, the cost of constructing Honolulu's rail system is paid for in full when the project is completed. Would you please tell us specifically how you're going to pay for your bus rapid transit plan? And don't say you'll use the excise tax fund because it will be gone should you kill rail. Well, I think I mentioned earlier, Kurt, that I would go to the legislature and ask them to revise the, the, the rail surcharge law. And I'm confident that will happen. Secondly, uh, bus rapid transit is about one-fifth the cost of rail. That's why no city comparable to Honolulu is doing steel-on-steel -steel heavy rail like they're doing here. So that's where I'm going to get the money. And, uh, you know, Kirk, uh, I think that um, uh, when you say there will be no debt, uh, you're living in a dream world. The studies indicate that uh, these rail projects average a 40% cost overrun for construction. A 41% uh, 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 of actual uh, ridership. There's going to be debt. You're going to have to find new money. And I've asked you before, uh, where are you going to get that money from? You keep saying that uh, there will be no debt. Uh, I think that's unreal. 
is unrealistic and it shows, I think, a lack of experience. All right, thank you very much. Now we have a question from Andrew Pereira for Mr. Carlisle. Mayor Carlisle, just today the City Council passed Bill 11 by a 7-2 vote which bans all commercial activities at Kailua and Kamana Beach. Do you support this bill? Do you plan to sign it into law? Some real, real questions about it, and uh, I believe in the purposes of the law. I think that there, there's, there's not the slightest doubt that this is a sm very small stretch of beach, uh, and it's being overrun by commercial activities. Uh, so I think that they have a fair, fair uh, complaint. On the other hand, eliminating all commercial activities there, as opposed to a compromise with a reasonable amount, uh, is going to have some draconian effects as well. Uh, I can't imagine Waikiki without. Uh, the uh, surf opportunities that are given to the people who come there and I think that there ought to be similar opportunities with a minimum of impact on the people there so uh, but with a 7-2 they can override any veto would I look forward to vetoing this uh, I'll consider it but right now my thoughts are that's very unlikely all right thank you very much mr. Caetano one minute as a rebuttal I support the uh, the, the, the the legislation you know uh, when I was governor um, the the uh, uh, dispute at the Hanalei River went on for about 20 years. I went down to Kauai, I took a look at it, I saw all the local people uh, away from the beach and all of this activity going on, and I issued an executive order which brought that controversy to an end. Uh, you couldn't do the, uh, 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 sell the, the zodiacs and all of that anymore. The, I have not used Waikiki Beach in the last 50 years. Somebody comes here from Japan or, or the mainland, they use it more, than, more in one week than I, I do in my entire life. Some beaches on this, in, in this island and this state should be left to local people. All right, thank you, Mr. Cayetano. Mr. Caldwell. Yeah, I am troubled by the legislation. I think um, definitely there are beaches that are being overrun by commercial activity, and Kailua is a good example of that. Um, Lanikai is another one, and Kamana Beach. And I think we need to find a balance. I think we need to respect the, uh, the local users of these beaches that I go to with my wife and daughter. Um, and we see that increased commercial activity. But I would have been in favor of more regulation, time, place, manner type of regulation, maybe restricting the number of vendors who go to the beach, controlling where they drop off and pick up, so that there is this balance. Because as Peter's mentioned, tourism is an important industry. We need to find that balance. But hey, we all live here. We need to have the use of these beaches and enjoy them without being overrun by tourists. All right, thank you very much. We have a question now from Catherine Cruz to Mr. Caldwell. Members of the Occupy Honolulu movement have remained at Thomas Square since November of 2011. What should the city do about the situation? Well, I, I, I'm hoping they would use the legislation that I helped worked on when I was at the city that, that prohibits tents from being set up on public property, on sidewalks and other types of public property. That legislation didn't make it when I left the city, but I was so passionate about it. I worked with Tulsi Gabbert, um, talked to her about the legislation. She made it better. It passed. It's now law, and it has been used. I think it needs to be used more effectively. Here's my point. These sidewalks, these places along our streets are for everyone, not just one group that wants to camp there and set up an occupation. Um, it impacts how people can traverse in that area. It is unsightly. Hey, I believe in the First Amendment, free speech, and the right to demonstrate. But no one, no one in this community has a right to own any part of our public property. And I would make sure that didn't happen. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Carlisle, one minute. i, I got to tell you, they're a blight on a beautiful place. Uh, they are absolutely and unequivocally not there for any other purpose than to, base, to, to be a pain in the neck. They're uh, not something that we need there. I'd like, if I had the opportunity, I'd pull a Frank Fozzi and... When they're out there, bulldoze down all of their tents. Uh, but you can't do it anymore. Uh, and that's because of social legislation that was passed by the United States Supreme Court in terms of uh, the ability to, to basically, uh, to, the, 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 you can't use the vagrancy laws anymore. And the vagrancy laws were, were tailor-made for these kinds of situations so that you could get them the help they needed or get them out of there to stop uh, inflicting the area that they're in. And people are incredibly frustrated, I'm frustrated at it, but we don't have the legal framework to be able to do it anymore because of both what the United States Supreme Court has said and uh, the, city, the, uh, the state Supreme Court has said. So uh, we're all frustrated. Everybody has a right to be frustrated. Am I angry about it? Yes. Do I have to follow the law? Yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ca uh, Carlo. Mr. Caetano, one minute. 
I believe in the First Amendment and the right, uh, the freedom to uh, assemble. But uh, I think these guys have made their point. Uh, they made their point a long time ago. And if, if there were the legal means to do it, I'd, I'd move them out of there. Because for the first time, I agree with these two, two, two guys uh, that, uh, you know, the people have the right to, to traverse without being blocked. Uh, and uh, I think that, as I said earlier, uh, these guys don't have the right to just camp out on the sidewalk forever. Thank you very much. Now we have a question from Chad Blair to Mr. Carlisle. Thank you, Paula. Mayor Carlisle, can you give us three specific examples of things that have improved in the city under your watch as mayor? Technology, uh, the, the rainy day fund, uh, the absence of politics as usual in the city and county of Honolulu. Uh, that's a start. Uh, I could go on for quite a bit of time uh, in telling you exactly what uh, we've done in the last two years. But uh, if that's all you want, the number of three, uh, that's right off the top of my head and easy. All right, thank you. Mr. Caetano, one minute. <clears throat> I'll, I'll pass. You know, I don't know what I've just done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Combo. I'll, I'll list three things that, that have not been done or have gotten worse. One is the five year moratorium on construction out in the Aea Waipahu area that Ben talked about because of the capacity of sewer um, over capacity. I think that there are short, short term solutions that could be done, but instead, the bureaucratic moratorium. Just wait. Two, the buses, the, the shrinking of service. The rerouting of buses, putting women and our elderly in danger, making them wait another hour, big problems. And then the siting of the landfill. First it was Kailua, eh, not Kailua, Kohuku, what next? Those are three things that were not done or done badly. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Now we've concluded our questions for the evening, and it's had some lively exchange there. Now each candidate will get two minutes for closing statements. Mayor Carlisle, we're going to begin with you. Two minutes. It's been less than two years since I took office. In that time, the Carlisle administration hosted APEC flawlessly and impressively, survived a tsunami scare, successfully complied, complied with the first year under a global consent decree for sewers, opened the mayor's office of housing, began mapping important agricultural lands to preserve this resource, selected a buyer for the city's affordable housing portfolio of $142 million. We can use this to retire housing debt and save taxpayers $8.5 million each year forever. Cleaned up miles of the Waianae coastline, including long-neglected beaches, parks that had become dumping grounds, started an award-winning transparency website, introduced smart parking meters, and mobile applications, created a complete streets policy for bikes and pedestrians to live together, saved close to $20 million into the rainy day fund and paid down $80 million towards unfunded employee benefit, unfunded employee benefits, reduced the city's debt service for the first time in eight years, maintained the city's strong financial ratings while cities such as Stockton and San Bernardino in California are declaring bankruptcy. These accomplishments were all in addition to the many benchmarks reached in the rail project, which include starting it, getting it going, and getting the federal funding, which took years but didn't happen until I got involved and the Carlisle administration got involved. Under this administration, we were named the number one digital city in the country, one of the healthiest employers of the state, and we rank, rank high for overall quality of life. This year, Honolulu was recognized for the first time as excellence in public procurement, received a Sunny Award for having one of the most transparent government websites in the United States, and was a Green City finalist for its recycling initiatives. This is a city in motion, and you better believe these accomplishments and honors go to the entire city team. Aloha. Thank you, Mr. Carlisle. Mr. Caldwell, two minutes for your closing statement. First, I wanted to thank uh, KITV and Hawaii News Now for, for broadcasting this. I think it's a fantastic example of a partnership and the kind of teamwork that I talk about I also wanted to thank the, the viewing audience for sticking, sticking around and listening to this debate. I hope you saw the differences between the three of us. For me, I've been conducting listening tours all over this island for months now, going into 
discrete neighborhoods, and listening to people's concerns. And the one thing that is really clear to me is that people want a mayor who is accountable. Now, what does this mean? It means someone who's not sitting behind a desk in a hands-off management style, but someone who is leading to the front of problems and working really, really hard. No shortcuts, no gimmicks. It's pulling the team down at Honolulu Holly together every single day to address issues like making sure that our city remains the safest big city in America. That yes, our potholes are filled and our roads are repaved. That we do fix our sewer system and our water system. And that we take good care of our parks and clean our bathrooms. It is about all these things. Our mission, the mission of the mayor, is to do the things that make a difference in people's lives every day in very nitty gritty kinds of ways. That's what I want to do. The truth is, the job of mayor never, ever stops. It is 24-7, seven days a week. The key to doing this job successfully is you have to love this job. I love this job. And I'm asking for your vote for me tonight so that I can return to the job of mayor and do the very best job for all of you. Thank you so much. Good night. And I'll see you around town in the next couple of weeks. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Caldwell. And Mr. Cayetano, you have the final word tonight. Thank you very much for having us tonight. You know, we've had some fun here uh, this evening. But uh, I think events over the last week in particular uh, have driven a, uh, a point home to me. Rail is a big issue, but the real issue in this campaign is about power, political power. Big business, big labor, and a select few have been running things in this town for a very, very long time. They have their fingers in nearly everything that affects our lives and our children's future. They influence or intimidate politicians to do their bidding, and they try to crush those who don't go along. What they have done is they have taken political power, which rightfully belongs to you, the people. This can be a transformational election in Hawaii politics. Let's take the city government back, and let's return power where it rightfully belongs with you, the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cayetano. And thank you, gentlemen, for participating in tonight's mayor debate. And we want to also thank Hawaii News Now, PBS Hawaii, and KHVH Radio for helping us to bring this debate to as many of you as possible. We also want to thank you, the viewers. If you're not registered to vote, there's still time you have until tomorrow. The primary election, Saturday, August 11th, just a month away. Thanks so much for joining us. Until next time, aloha. Good night.